Well, we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you, everybody, so much for joining. This might be a bit of a different format than what you're used to in Zoom because we've had such a great response to this program. Um, we are over 100 participants that wanted to join in in these variety of opportunities in these next several weeks. So we've had to switch from a normal Zoom that only allows about 100 people to a webinar that allows many more people. And so some of the features of Zoom that you're used to may not be available to you. Um, the chat is not available um, uh, except to me as the leader uh, or the host of this event. Um, you can chat to me with questions, but there isn't a general chat session. So just a couple of those little details out of the, out of the way in the beginning. I am Deacon Shell Huth, and I serve United Lutheran Seminary as the Director of Lifelong Learning, Certificate Studies, Team Ministry Candidates, Field Formation, uh, and Adjunct Faculty for both campuses. And I am so thrilled to have everybody here today. And I'm thrilled for the partnerships that we've, we've built and continue to build on, most specifically with Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Services. This webinar is being recorded so that it will be available for folks after the event um, for reference and sharing with others and using as learning opportunities in your context as you're moving forward. As I said, the chat feature has been disabled except to chat with me for um, generalized questions. The Q&A session is open. And so if you have a question for one of our panelists or presenters today, I ask that you please post your questions there and then after their presentation, I will moderate the Q&A session uh, by reading those questions for the panelists. So if you have a question for our panelist, please post it in the Q&A section. Like I said, I'm really thrilled to be in this time in this space with you all and again for the partnerships. I love working in partnership with others because um, my own edification is built. Um, but also, um, I learned so much from the partnerships that I engage with. And this one with LIRS has just been a delight and a joy, um, personally, because I've been able to reconnect with colleagues that I haven't been able to connect with in a while. And so I'm going to turn things over to Reverend Sharon Baglios as one of my LIRS partners. Thank you, Shell. We are so happy to be here and to be presenting the program for the fall convocation. I have wonderful memories um, serving as a pastor in the Northeastern Pennsylvania Synod and the Lower Susquehanna Synod, uh, memories of attending the spring and the fall convocations. Those were wonderful opportunities to learn and be renewed in ministry and a time for reconnecting and celebrating. This year, Convocation is an opportunity to reconnect while you remain at home. Um, we are using this new format, which um, in a wonderful way allows us to bring new voices to the conversation and new ways to connect. We are so happy to connect with United Lutheran Seminary at this time when the issues with which we at LIRS uh, confront every single day are so important. They are in the news and the people who are impacted are in our communities. And so we are um, presenting three different programs on three consecutive Thursdays. The first is an opportunity to refresh with Bible study. Next week, we will revisit our Lutheran legacy of ministries of welcome. And the third session is a time to reframe our understanding of ministry possibilities for today. There are people, um, essential workers in our communities who are is suffering, who are struggling, and we as people of faith are called to respond to those who need our faithful care and welcome and um, refuge that we can offer. And so um, we are pleased to bring those three sessions 
And Shell, I'll turn it back to you. Thanks so much, Sharon. Um, our presidents, uh, Dr. Guy Irwin, Reverend Dr. Guy Irwin, and um, President Krish Vijnaraja, Vijnaraja, Vignaraja, there it is, Vignaraja, Krish Vignaraja, um, are going to try and join us today, but to be sure that we heard from them, I have recorded some greetings from these presidents. And so um, I'm gonna share my screen with you all and we'll hear from the, the presidents in greeting because they're very excited about this partnership as well. I'm Bishop Guy Irwin, the new president at United Lutheran Seminary. And I'm delighted to be a part of this important convocation conversation today. Our topic is uh, immigration. And we have as our guest, the president and CEO of Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Services, uh, Krish Vijnaraja. It's an honor to have her with us, and I know that, uh, that we'll be enriched by this conversation. Before I turn to her, let me say a few things about how this uh, convocation functions. It's an important way for us to bring the community of ULS together from both campuses and our wider constituency to connect around a topic of importance to us. We do this regularly. Traditionally, we do it on both campuses. In this case, we're doing it virtually as we're doing everything this fall. It's a blessing to be able to connect in this way even when we're not allowed to meet face to face. As you all know, Lutherans are a church of immigrants. Uh, there is no native Lutheranism in North America. It was brought to us by migrants from Europe and expanded among the population of the United States to populations who had not known Lutheranism before. As a consequence of that, Lutherans have always been about understanding what it means to move from one place to another, to bring a heritage with them, to be assimilated into a new context and a new culture, and of course to aid subsequent waves of migrants after them. For many years, of course, our main focus was people just like us. That is to say, uh, of people who observe the same faith, who came from the same countries, or from the same part of, of Europe. But in the modern era, Lutherans have been much more involved in the resettlement of refugees from every part of the world. Non-Lutherans, non-Christians, people generally. In the Synod, I used to serve as Synod Bishop, the Southwest California Synod. A few years ago, we made the focus of our Synod Assembly, the theme of welcoming the stranger. And we took up all of the ways in which Lutherans have been connected to immigration and refugees through the years. As you know, after the Second World War, a great number of Lutherans themselves were refugees, and the United States took a very important role in resettling folks like that here. Again, they were much like us, people related to us uh, by faith and by European background. But it was a monumental task, and it set us up well to deal later with other, a more diverse group of refugees. One of my prized possessions is a large brass button that you would wear on your lapel that says LWF on it. It's quite a large button, not anything you'd ever wear uh, if you didn't want it to be seen. And I was given it some years ago. It's the button that an LWF volunteer would wear to the train station when they were meeting a refugee coming in from parts unknown who didn't know who was going to meet them in a day in which people didn't know, couldn't just send a, a video or a, a camera photo. They needed to be able to recognize who was there for them. And this button would allow the refugee to know who had come to see them at the station. I think it's an important symbol of our willingness to welcome others. And so I wore this at our assembly. I wish I had it with me now, but in the process of moving, I packed it someplace too deep to reach for safekeeping. It's truly safe, but distant. And when I get it out again, I will put it in my office where I can see it every day because it is a powerful reminder to me of the sacrifices American Lutherans were willing to make at one point to greet people to this country. And I think we are still willing to do that. 
the existence and continued uh, functioning of LIRS in a time of extraordinarily difficult, extraordinary difficulty in actually being able to welcome migrants is a, is a, is a testimony to our commitment. There will be a day again in which we are able to welcome people as we wish. It is hard right now, but we will get through this. And part of what I hope we'll learn in the process of having these conversations is how that future looks from LIRS's perspective. So now I'd like to kick it over to our guest, uh, to Krish, as she leads us into, uh, into conversation about this remarkable ministry of Lutherans in America. Thank you, Dr. Irwin, and many thanks, Shell, for the invitation to bring Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Service to this year's program. I'm so grateful to the United Lutheran Seminary for the opportunity to highlight our mission and message of welcome to the faith leaders who are part of the convocation. So I won't mince words. This is an extraordinarily difficult time for immigrants and refugees in our country. Even before the pandemic, the United States refugee admissions were at a record low. Just 18,000 people admitted into the United States per year, compared to an average of 95,000 a year across previous administrations. And these historically low numbers are in the face of the worst refugee crisis in our history. Worldwide today, there are 26 million refugees who have faced war, persecution, and other unimaginable atrocities. And now they are stuck in overcrowded refugee camps, living in constant fear of a coronavirus outbreak that would be absolutely devastating in such desolate conditions. Even in the United States, the pandemic has hit immigrants and new Americans particularly hard. Our borders were closed to refugees for months, and while resettlement recently resumed in a very limited capacity, we are still on track to resettle the lowest number of refugees in our nation's history. For asylum seekers, the term that refers primarily to immigrants from Mexico and Latin America seeking entry to the United States through our southern border, things have been no better. Asylum seekers at our southern border are being summarily expelled without due process including unaccompanied children who were fleeing human trafficking. Those that made it into the country pre-pandemic are largely locked up in ICE detention where some have contracted coronavirus and even died from the disease without access to appropriate care. One Virginia facility that I visited just before the COVID outbreak now has had 93% of detainees test positive. And the pandemic has taken both the livelihoods and lives of our immigrant neighbors, many of whom have been purposefully excluded from federal legislative relief packages. Despite all of this, call me crazy, but I remain still hopeful, particularly when I'm speaking to so many members of the Lutheran community, which has been so instrumental in helping our refugee and immigrant neighbors for the past 80 years. LIRS was founded on the brink of the Second World War to assist in the resettlement of Lutherans persecuted by the Nazi regime. But that mission quickly grew over time. So when Fidel Castro took power in Cuba, LIRS resettled some of the hundreds of thousands arriving during the, during the Cuban refugee airlift. After the fall of Saigon, when America welcomed a flood of Vietnamese refugees, LRS transformed from a four staffer operation to over 100 staff, all in the space of just a few weeks. In the 1990s, we helped restore a sense of home to those displaced by war, conflict, and ethnic cleansing in the Balkans. In the 2000s, we began welcoming the lost boys and girls young Sudanese refugees who had been separated from their families after fleeing civil war. Over the past decade, we've continued this legacy of compassion by welcoming newly arrived refugees from Syria, Afghanistan, Burma, Tibet, Thailand, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Ukraine, and beyond. Which brings us to today. 
Even in these unprecedented times, I believe so strongly in the Lutheran power of welcome and the commitment to welcome the stranger, as the Bible calls all of us to do. Lutherans have been heeding this call and responding to these challenges for decades. I'm confident that tenacity will only intensify. I'm so grateful for the welcome the Lutheran community has extended to me and to inherit this exceptional legacy of welcome. Thank you for your time, your passion, and your everlasting dedication to the most vulnerable. What a joy it is to be serving with both of these folks. Um, I'm so thankful to have Reverend Dr. Irwin on board as the president of ULS. Um, he brings with him a wealth of academic knowledge and life experience. And I, for one, am so very excited to see where we're gonna go. I am now going to turn our time over to our panelists, uh, Dr. Crystal Hall and Reverend Dr. G. Alanis, and I'm gonna allow them to introduce themselves um, because their titles are quite numerous, just like mine. And um, so I'll turn things over to them. Thank you so much, Shell, and thank you to Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Service for this opportunity. My name is Dr. Crystal Hall. I am Assistant Professor of Biblical Studies at United Lutheran Seminary, and I have the distinct pleasure of introducing Reverend Dr. J. Alanis, and to thank him for his willingness to partner in this dialogue that we are going to share with you. So a bit about Dr. Alanis. Dr. Alanis is currently the Associate Professor of Theology, Culture, and Mission of the Lutheran School of Theology at Chicago, LSTC. He is also the Executive Director of the Extension Program of the Lutheran Seminary Program of the Southwest, located at the Episcopal Seminary of the Southwest, and serves as Senior Instructor. Prior to his academic appointment, he served as pastor of Trinity Lutheran Church in San Antonio from 1992 to 1996. During his ministry, he chaired the Southwestern Texas Synod's Multicultural and Anti-Racist okay. Community. His academic interests include contextual borderland theology, Latinx spirituality, and the social ethics of Dietrich Bonhoeffer and Martin Luther King Jr. His doctoral dissertation focused on the Hebrew doctrine of the Imago Dei, the image of God construct, as a lens for a theology of welcome for the displaced stranger. In 2019, he was part of a panel that examined the subject of border walls at the international conference held in Berlin at the Lutheran Center in Wittenberg, Germany. He is a frequent keynote speaker at various synod events and is a contributor to the Lutheran devotional Christ in Our Home and Lutheran Preaching Clubs. He holds a Bachelor of Arts from Washington University at St. Louis and the University of Madrid in Spain, a Master of International Management from the American Graduate School of International Management, a Juris Doctor degree from the University of Texas, a Master of Divinity degree from the Lutheran Seminary Program of the Southwest, and a Master of Theology and Doctor of Philosophy from the Lutheran School of Theology at Chicago. In 2013, he was awarded the Distinguished Alumnus Award by LSTC. So, bienvenido, welcome, Dr. Alanis. It is a pleasure to be with you today. So the image that we wanted to start with is the border wall. But before we get to the border wall, we wanted to share with you a passage of scripture that will ground our time together. And so you have a sense of where we're going to be going together. I'm going to be setting up some framing ideas. And then Dr. Alanis and I are really going to have a dialogue. He's going to share from his experience. I'll ask some framing questions and we'll have some, we'll have some exchange together. So our grounding text for today comes from Ephesians 2, 13 and 14 from the New Revised Standard Version. And it reads, But now in Christ Jesus, 
you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace. In his flesh, he has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall. That is the hostility between us. So there's a reference to both groups here in this verse. And so this is both the Jews and other nations or the Gentiles. And the Jews and the other nations were part of the early church that in its earliest days was divided from one another. These groups were divided by language, by culture, by ethnicity, by different kinds of religious practices. And so the disciple of Paul, who likely wrote Ephesians, is assuming that this conflict has already been resolved, that the dividing wall has already been brought down. And so we're going to continue to wrestle with this vision of the dividing wall being torn down and the hostility between us being something that is passing away. And so this text is going to ground our time together. And We'll start, we'll have many images to share in our time, but the the first one that we wanted to start with is in fact the border wall. And so when you hear about the dividing wall in Ephesians, perhaps one of the first images that might come to mind for you is something like this image. This is from the border wall at the US-Mexico border in San Diego and Tijuana. It extends into the Pacific Ocean. And as has already been alluded to, immigration and refugee status, these are deeply divisive, but also deeply urgent issues in our context today. And so this is just one image from the many with which we are bombarded today. One thing that I want to share, particularly about this location of the border wall, is that faith communities have been meeting jointly on either side of the border wall for years to exchange services together, to share services together as a way of continuing to pray for peace, as a, as a way of continuing to pray for reconciliation. And so we shared this image both to acknowledge the ways in which the, the wall exists in our popular culture but also as a way of connecting to our own experience. Um, Dr. Alanis has has his own connections to this kind of experience. Um, And Dr. Alanis, I'll pass it over to you if you wanna say a word or two about the border wall before we move on to the next piece. Sure, well, thank you, Dr. Hall, for the introduction and for uh, inviting me to be a part of this convocation. I I feel very honored to be with you this morning and to share some some words of experience and and, uh, maybe some wisdom that I've gained over the years as a person of the borderlands. In fact, I grew up in South Texas, uh, not far far from the uh, Rio Grande River and what is today now the border wall uh, that has been constructed during the past uh, 10 or 15 years. Uh, I didn't grow up with the wall. I used to often go to Mexico across the border, to Mexico, uh, with my parents to visit uh, my relatives who lived right across the border. And so this was always a Sunday outing in which we would cross the border to go and shop at the market, to have lunch at the fine restaurants on the Mexican side of the border and to visit, spend time in the afternoon with my, my cousins, my uncle and aunt. And so this wall is a um, new experience for me and many others who live along the U.S.-Mexico border wall. And uh, a colleague of mine, a Lutheran uh, pastoral agent who lives in Mexico City, at the conference in Berlin mentioned that the wall he made the statement, the wall is Mexico. In other words, now the image of the nation is what we physically see as a border wall that did not used to exist among two partner nations that share a common history, a common language, since the borderlands were part of, the, uh, of Mexico in the 19th century. 
And uh, so this is a new phenomenon that we're wrestling with, that we uh, live in tension with. And so it's, it's, uh, it's a mark of hostility, if you will. To see the border wall is to see hostility that has been imposed upon a people that have for centuries, uh, decades, experienced this movement of people back and forth a family going back and forth, of commerce going back and forth. But now we have to face this harsh reality of, a, of an imposed border wall that separates families, uh, se separates commerce, that basically is, uh, is a very, is what Gloria Ansel Dua, the, the Chicana poet, calls a, a wound that does not heal. And so we as a church are, I feel, call to minister in that sacred space. Uh, we sacralize it, we make it sacred by going there and being a part of that community, standing in solidarity with a people of faith. And so that is part of the ministry that I've done uh, in my current position as professor or associate professor for the past 20 years. So thank you for inviting me to share some words on this on this frame, uh, Dr. Hall. Thank you. So the the first question that we thought that we might shape some of our dialogue around is this question of being in a time of pandemic. How does your story, Dr. Alanis, connect with the breaking down of the dividing wall and welcoming the stranger, as we heard about in Ephesians? You bet. Well, if you move on to the next frame, I will start addressing my family story and how um, how this scripture plays uh, into the heart of my family. Uh, my father and grandparents uh, came from northern Mexico. They emigrated to South Texas uh, around 1918, 1917, during the time of the Mexican Revolution, which lasted, which was a civil war that lasted for 10 years. And during that time period, about a million Mexicans crossed the border, fleeing the social, the economic, and the political unrest. And uh, many fled for fear of violence uh, and also because of hunger. And I received, uh, I heard about this reality from my parents because they lived this experience. And my mother came over and her family came over from Tamaulipas, Mexico, a border a northern, north, northern Mexico border state in 1913. And just three months after her parents crossed, she was born in South Texas. So it was that same time period. And uh, they crossed, at that, at that time there was no border wall, of course, and there were bridges and there was a river. And so they crossed that border, that river, that border uh, to flee the violence and to flee the hunger that they were experiencing in Mexico. Let's move on to the next frame, if you will. So here, here is a photo that was in a book that was written about uh, my hometown of San Juan in South Texas, uh, in, in a part of the state that is called the Rio Grande Valley. You may have uh, heard of the uh, famous ruby red grapefruits and uh, navel oranges that come from South Texas. Well, that's, that's where they come from, from the Rio Grande Valley where I grew up. And this photo was taken around 1915. My mother is, is a little one, about two years old, standing on that chair next to her sisters, my aunties. And I got to know uh, all of those but one who died before I was born. And so, they came over in 1913, and of course, you may all remember the Spanish flu pandemic of 1918. Well, it hit South Texas during that time, and my mother was five years old. She was uh, one of the youngest of a family of about eight. Uh, there were uh, two younger brothers than her, and she used to tell the story of how everyone was sick in bed, and that she and she was not. She was the only one who didn't catch the flu. And she would take a glass of cold water to all of her siblings and her parents because they couldn't get out of bed. They were that sick. 
And so this uh, family was ministered to by a German family by the name of Mellenbrook that were also migrants or immigrants. They had come from Germany to the East Coast. They had then settled in Nebraska. They had moved to Kansas. And then 100 years ago, they heard of the far, a rich farmland by the river of South Texas that was being sold for not very much uh, 100 years ago. So they moved down to San Juan and they became the local farmers. And so the local Mexican families and native Mexicans and Mexican Americans would purchase uh, vegetables, eggs, milk from their farm. They would go to the family home to the front porch where they would uh, purchase these goods and take them home. And so they found that there were all of these children present uh, who um, needed to hear the gospel through Bible stories. Well, at the same time, the matriarch, uh, and I'll show her the frame in a few minutes, Laura Mellenbrook, she had home remedies that she took to my mother's family during the Spanish flu pandemic, and she helped nurse them back to health. And my mother used to say that she remembered her coming in with an oil lamp into the family home and bringing her home remedies and applying them to all of the family that was in bed. And slowly but surely, they all came back to life. None of them died from the Spanish flu pandemic. And so that was the contact, the first contact we had with a, or that my family had with a German family of a Lutheran faith tradition. And so uh, with that ministry, the seeds of the first mission start uh, in South Texas with, the Latin, with what I refer to as the Latinx community, or in this case, the Latina Lutherans in this uh, photo uh, began. And, uh, and these ladies became the first Latina Lutherans uh, that were charter, they were charter members of that mission church that was chartered as St. John's Lutheran Church in 1925. So we're, we're 95 years old. And, uh, and so that, that friendship was nurtured through the sense of, of, uh, of a healing ministry and a visitation of, a, of the family and the offering of their, of their healing arts. And that, that's when, let's say, there was a dividing, a cultural or linguistic dividing wall. That wall was, was crossed over, penetrated by the gospel itself, by the ladies who felt compelled to share their healing ministry, their pastoral care ministry, their storytelling of the Gospels with the children, and all of that bore fruit. And it became that mission start for that first uh, Latinx. And I refer to Latinx as the term that the Latin, uh, that the, what used to be referred to and is referred to by some as the Hispanic community is, is now used uh, as, as, as our, our own claim to identity because Hispanic was really imposed upon us back in 1970 by the U.S. Census. So uh, there are many ways of self-identifying and Latinx is a term that I'm comfortable with and Latina is simply the feminine for these uh, Latinx women. So we can move on to the next frame. So this is my father's family, the Alanis family, a, a photo that was taken in Reynosa, Mexico, right across the border from Hidalgo and McAllen in the Rio Grande Valley, shortly before they crossed the border to South Texas. They were ranchers. Uh, my, father, my grandfather was a peace officer as well. And I have been to the homestead in Northern Mexico. And I, and I understand why my gran grandmother, Maria Rita Perez, did not want to come to Texas. Of course not. She wanted to stay in her home. And I've been to that home, it's still there made of adobe, thick walls, the beautiful hearth by, by, near, by the river nearby. But the revolution was compelling them, forcing them into the experience of exile. 
the experience of diaspora. And so I got to know all of these folks that you see on this picture, all my aunties, my uncles, my father is, stand, is a young man standing behind my grandfather. And the little girl next to my grandfather was my aunt uh, Victoria, who was also my godmother. And all of these people brought their Roman Catholic faith tradition with them to South Texas. And, and they also were ministered to by the Lutheran Church that was located right across the street from the majority of these folks that you see uh, on this photograph. Uh, so the next frame, please. And so this uh, first, I call it the first Mexican Lutheran church. I guess today we would call it Latinx, a Mexican because it was uh, chartered in 1925. That would have been the common language for people from Mexico or native people of Mexican descent born in Texas. What, what came to be known as, uh, the people who came to be known as the Mexican Americans. And so this church was the, the, uh, church that was built in 1925 or chartered in 1925. This is where I was baptized. This is where I was uh, in the new, or new church that was built in 1960. That's where I was confirmed, ordained, and installed as, as associate professor of LSPS. And so here you see the seeds of that encounter, of that encuentro between a German Lutheran family and a Roman Catholic Mexican family of immigrants who were forced to become refugees, to seek asylum in South Texas from the ravages of the Civil War in Mexico. And in that sharing of the faith tradition, my mother's family predominantly became a Lutheran. And my mother used to tell the story, my mother passed away five years ago at the age of 102. She was the last surviving charter member of St. John's, and she used to tell the story of how uh, her, the, when her father took his daughters, his family, to that mission storefront at the time, he heard the sermon and turned to his daughters and said, from now on, we are going to worship here. So I like to believe, and I imagine myself believing that my grandfather heard a message of grace a message of welcome, a message of hospitality, because those first missioners were predominantly German pastors. And so they were crossing, those German pastors or German-American pastors, in fact, the one who baptized me was a Danish immigrant who came in through Ellis Island. They were modeling the, the pastoral care presence of crossing the cultural divide of crossing that border wall that now exists as a wound in the heart of, of the soul of a people in South Texas. And so that spirit of, of welcome, of hospitality, of bienvenidos, you know, of a gospel that crosses borders and cultures and languages and forms one familia in Cristo, one family, became good news, living good news to my grandfather and his family as recent immigrants from Mexico. And so the next frame, if you will. So this is the oil painting of uh, Laura Mellenbrook, the matriarch of the, of the Mellenbrook family. And I'm still in relationship with this family here in Austin. And uh, the, uh, this oil, oil painting hangs in the fellowship hall at St. John's. And the caption, the nameplate reads, Laura Mellenbrook, mother of Mexican missions. And my mother remembers, remembered her well, remembered her voice, loved her dearly, and loved the family dearly, just as I love the Mellenbrook family today. And in fact, this past Friday, the last surviving Mellenbrook in-law who married one of her sons, one of Laura's sons, turned 104. And I took her some flowers at the uh, living, uh, assisted living center where she lives. And I often visit Julia and, and, and hear her stories because she was a Spanish teacher in South Texas in the Rio Grande Valley. And so she knew my family. She knows all of this history. 
and I know her her son, uh, who is also a member of my church here in Austin. And, uh, and he, he tells me, you know, Jay, we were all struggling at that time. The Mellenbrook and the Alanis and Trevino families, we were just trying to make it as immigrants and newcomers to South Texas. But, it was, but we formed this alliance through the gospel and through the sharing of our faith traditions. And that's what enriched our lives, and that is what sowed the seeds of this friendship that is over 100 years old. The next frame, if you would, Dr. Hall. So here we have the picture of the daughter. She's the young lady on the right of the frame standing behind the children. This is Irene. And she learned Spanish. She spoke it fluently. She majored in it at Capitol University. She went back to South Texas and she became a, a lay missioner. And she would visit all of the mission posts along the Rio Grande River, the Lutheran mission posts. And she would write her own homilies and take a portable organ of some kind. And she would play the Spanish hymnody, taught it to all of these families, immigrant and native Mexican American families of South Texas. And here you see her in this photo circa the 1920s, teaching the Mexican and Mexican American children those gospel stories that she became famous for. And I, my mother would speak with such loving terms about Irene when I was growing up. And when I was a pastor in San Antonio in the 1990s, I had the grace of meeting her for the first time. She was in a nursing home. She was uh, fit mentally. We had a lovely conversation in Spanish. And she was in her 90s and uh, just a lovely person. So I was able to connect the story with the person and got to meet Irene, who was a beloved uh, member of the familia, of the family. I heard many, many oral stories from my mother about her. So she epitomized for my family a person who tore down those walls of hostility, if you will, the tore down the walls of, of uh, cultural, linguistic, even theological difference by simply sharing her, her friendship with my, and with my family, with sharing her mother's healing arts with my family. She built that bridge that continues to be crossed today with the many winter Texans that come down and become a part of our community in South Texas and that historically have had mission work across the border that has halted because of the current violence, but there is still some mission work being done across the border. And so she, along with her mother and her family, set the, uh, set the, the, the groundwork for this kind of building of bridges across cultural divides that continues through this day in our current ministry. And the next frame. So, Dr. Hall, I'd like to turn this over to you. Great. Thank you so much for sharing your story of your family, Dr. Alanis. As we were preparing for our time together, um, as we were exchanging stories, um, one, of the, um, one of the things that Dr. Alanis shared really sparked some of my own family memory. Uh, this is a picture of um, the, the young woman on the right is my great grandmother um, and the woman on the left who's sitting is my great great grandmother. Um, this was taken in the United States but um, the family had recently immigrated from Sweden and um, I'm fourth generation Swedish American on my mother's side and I was as we were exchanging about all of these experiences of immigration, I, I kept thinking about how my own family, as coming from Northern Europe, they also were immigrants. They came here um, as domestic workers, as factory workers. They came here seeking a better life because they were poor. And yet, because of the realities of being from Northern Europe, um, because of the realities of white supremacy, that my family was able to culturally assimilate uh, because of their whiteness. And 
And it really produced a kind of what we talked about as cultural amnesia, that in it, especially among white communities, that if we don't continually remind ourselves of these experiences of immigration, that it is so easy to forget them. Uh, that the biblical verse that uh, comes to mind is, do not oppress the stranger because remember that you were once a stranger in the land of Egypt. And so because of so many of these contemporary dynamics around xenophobia and racism, some of us are able to disconnect in some ways from our immigrant experiences while others are not. And, and some of the, the privileges that come with that and some of the ways in which we must remember um, and the ways in which we must remind ourselves of our own, of our own histories and our positions in that. Uh, in the United States, we pride ourselves on being a nation of immigrants, and yet somehow it seems for some communities very easy to forget that. And so thanks for the opportunity to just share a little bit about my story as a way of connecting with some of, some of your story. So the, the next question that we wanted to, to think about with you all together is recognizing that in the third session, which I hope you will all be at in not, well, please come next Thursday, but also the following Thursday. Um, for the third session, we're really going to break down some of the, the concrete and practical ways to start applying some of what we're learning with LIRS in our respective ministry contexts. But we wanted to even anticipate some of where the discussion is going to be going over the next two Thursdays with this really concrete question. How can faith leaders break down the dividing wall and welcome the stranger in their pastoral care and worship practices? So Dr. Alanis, if you would share some um, examples from your ministry and experience, that would be wonderful. Sure, well, thank you again, Dr. Hall. Uh, let me just first say that I think we want to, we believe that we as Lutherans are a people of hospitality. And I, I, I want to sort of emphasize that, that idea that hospitality is something that uh, should be a living verb, if you will, not a noun, but a living verb in our communities of, of, of worship and fellowship. And how we, how we express that hospitality will probably differ from place to place, but uh, I'll offer some, some ideas of what I've used in ministry. However, I also want to sort of put a law and gospel, if you will, tension to that idea of hospitality. And I like to say that hospitality is not only a gift of grace that we offer others, just as we have been received by God in Jesus Christ, I like to argue, and I do with my students, that hospitality is also a human right, if you will. A human right that we can trace back to our biblical ancestors, Abraham and Sarah, and all those who followed them as sojourners in a foreign land. Sort of like Ruth, in the story of Ruth and Naomi, and others. Because in, in the biblical story, in the biblical canon, hospitality was a matter of life and or death. And it still is. It still is for the many immigrants who are coming to our communities of faith, not only along the U.S.-Mexico border, but throughout the nation. And I get to visit with and meet many of them at a displaced home for migrants here in Austin that has been actively receiving uh, asylum seekers and refugees since the 1980s. And they come from all over the world and they come through the Southern border. Uh, and so I see hospitality at this migrant, home of, of displaced migrants with the feeding that goes on, with the advocacy for their human rights that go on by the, by the staff, AmeriCorps staff, I see many volunteers who come and, and fellowship with, in fact, I'm a part of a faith service, an Episcopal service that is offered uh, once a month, at the end of the month, with a great fellowship meal that follows. And we, we, we preach in Spanish, we, the entire liturgy is in Spanish. 
I celebrate the Eucharist in Spanish, which is very moving for me because I'm offering the broken body of Christ and the blood of Christ to the most broken of the human family because I get to hear their stories. And it is just a very humbling experience. So to offer hospitality in your parishes might mean that you want to ex express in some way that sense of, of, uh, of, of, of uh, affirming the dignity that has been trampled upon by, by many of these folks over months or years of travel to get to our country. And human dignity is something that I consider God's stamp of approval on our creation. So if you can include a sprinkling of Spanish, for example, in your worship, you don't, know, you don't have to turn the, the whole worship service into Spanish, just a sprinkling. You know, in a, in a word of greeting, buenos dias, in the word of departure, vaya con Dios, in the blessing that is so important for the Latinx community in particular, we grow up with a sense that we are to be blessed by our elders who are the wisdom keepers of the community. So to be blessed not only by the clergy, but by the elders of the church, by the laying on of hands on our children in particular, is a sign of enormous, enormous expression of hospitality and welcome and affirmation of our human dignity, of our human worth, if you will. Lifting up, uh, mentioning, you know, the plight of the asylum seekers and refugees at the U.S.-Mexico border in the prayers of the church, not once in a while, but often, because that raises the consciousness of the community. And if there are recent immigrants arrivals that are worshiping with you, they will feel the impact of that prayer, of that sacred space, prayer, prayer that is being made on their behalf and on behalf of their families that have, that have stayed behind or that have been displaced along the journey. Introduce a hymn or a refrain of a hymn during communion or as part of the gradual prelude to the gospel. I attend a, a, several churches in town. Uh, one of them, First English, does that quite often. In fact, they print the Lord's Prayer in Spanish in the bulletin. And their, and their welcome paragraph at the beginning is in Spanish first, then in English, making sure that if any, there's a Spanish-speaking person in this heavily gentrified city of Austin worshiping with us on that day, they will feel made welcome because the language of the heart, the language of prayer is, is visible and it is heard in, in that worship space. Uh, those are tangible ways of doing it. And I would add that the advocacy for the human rights of your immigrants is also a very important uh, ministry that you can be a part of and, and a pastoral care practice. Because I live in a capital city of the state of Texas, we get to go to the capital and visit with legislators and press upon them our concern, our pastoral care concern, for the issues that are affecting the lives of our brothers and sisters in Christ who are on the journey of their faith to, to visit and become a part, not to visit, but to become a part of, of, a, of a hopeful sanctuary in this country, whether it be the church or a home for displaced migrants or a place of welcome in your own personal homes. Um, I think that the accompaniment theory that, you know, the ELCA has, has developed over the years is one that we should always keep in mind, that we're called to walk with the people. And by walking with, I mean, allowing yourself to listen deeply, listen deeply to the stories of, of, of these immigrants, because you will find your own, the, your own connection to their stories from your own family history, as I have done over the years. And which is why this ministry is so important to me because it's been part and parcel of my growing up in the faith as a Latino Lutheran. 
And so I advocate for the human dignity of God's people at every opportunity that I can, can. And that advocacy comes through worship practices, pastoral care practices, the blessing of God's people, whether in, in, in the sanctuary or in public spaces. Uh, you know, the just the opportunity to hear the story and to break bread or break tortilla with a family, you know, from, from another country in your sacred space is a breaking down of the dividing wall. And you will, in effect, be, bri be building bridges of welcome and hospitality, just like the Mellenbrook family did with my family 100 years ago. And I always like to tell the story to my students or tell my students that I'm, I'm telling their story 100 years later. Who is going to tell your story 100 years from now? And so I leave, I leave you with that thought. Amen. Thank you so much. So I'm going to stop the share now. Um, and I know that Shell is going to be facilitating uh, our Q&A. So I'm going to pass it back to Shell for her to do that. And it looks like you're on mute, Shell. My mouse pad is not listening to me. <laughs> Thank you so very much, both of you, for this presentation and um, Dr. Alanis for uh, the insight into your own family story. Um, I, I'm so enriched by being a part of people's stories and hearing from them. And so thank you so much uh, for sharing. The Q&A session is open. So if you have a question, please post it uh, in our Q&A. And uh, there's one that is not a question uh, from uh, Reverend Dr. Angela Zinman. She says that she's just giving a state of, statement of gratitude. Dr. Alanis and Dr. Hall are outstanding. Standing. Um, so there's a, a little kudos to the both of you. Um, I'll remind you that one of the questions that Dr. Hall posted was, how can faith leaders break down the dividing wall and welcome the stranger in their pastoral care and worship practices? Well, um, how can we do? I think I just addressed that in a way um, by these, but actually by intentionality because it really takes intention and a commitment to do it. Um, and so one of the things that I, to be honest with you, that when I served in the parish in San Antonio, uh, one of the things that I had to do was form a hospitality committee because it didn't exist when I got there. And I was noticing that if, if, if visitors came, there was no no contact with them during the fellowship hour. And so I, I made it a point to, to organize a group of four ladies who uh, I put to look for the visitors and make sure they spoke to them and invite them to the fellowship hall and invite them to the coffee. Because people who are not, you know, a, a church can be an imposing place if you're not familiar with it. Uh, structurally, uh, you don't know the people. It might be a, a totally foreign experience to you. And so sometimes you need that accompaniment, you know, even in our sacred spaces. And so uh, if you can do that, that will go a long ways. It made a big difference when I was serving in, in, in South San Antonio back in the 1990s. And then um, we also started... Meals on Wheels, would you believe? Because as a way to get people into the community. And so I had a group of folks serving on Meals and wh on Wheels, meeting neighbors that had been around that community for years, but whom they had never met. And, and that was a cross-cultural encounter as well. Because most of the community around the parish was Mexican-American, uh, and that most of my community that I was serving was was uh, a, a sprinkling of European uh, Americans, quite a few actually. So it was a, it was this crossing of borders that that uh, they had to do 
with my encouragement and my modeling, going into the community to meet people, discovering what the needs in the community were. In fact, I joined forces with uh, St. Leo's Catholic Church in South San Antonio to, to uh, discover the needs of the community and find ways to serve, serve together. And so I know, knowing that community, community, I know that immigration is going to be a very hot topic for them uh, these days. And it, it is part of their social justice ministry. So joining forces with other ecumenical partners and finding out what they're doing so that you don't necessarily repeat, reinvent the wheel, but joining forces with others who are already involved, like they are in South Texas, where I'm from. There are many groups, Team Brownsville, that people of faith connect with. There's the Angry Tias and Abuelas, which means angry aunties and grandmothers, who's a group of women who literally take the food to the bridge and they go as far into the bridge as they can, usually halfway, to deliver food, to deliver medical supplies, uh, you know, all these things that, that the asylum seekers who are trapped on the other side of the border need. You know, that's the humane treatment that they're, they're addressing. And so joining forces with these folks as people of faith, uh, as to, we every year, every January for a January term, uh, my Episcopal colleague and I take our students to the border to meet all of these folks so that they can partner with them as they do. Some will go back during the summer or make it a work study program for during weekends. They'll travel to the border uh, for Laredo specifically because it's about a two and a half hour drive. And they will stay there the weekend and serve in all of these ministries. So it's, it's a way not only to serve, but to equip themselves so that when they're called to ministry, wherever in the country they go to, they will have that resource with them and those contacts with them. And then they can join forces locally with those who are doing that kind of ministry and connecting with others along the border. So there are ways of doing this. These are just some, some of my ideas that come to mind. Thank you so much. We've got some questions coming in. And so the first one is from Dorette. Um, she says, excellent presentation. How much is being done to elevate Latina church leaders and other immigrant peoples in formal seminary, training them to train their own people and join in the ecumenical fellowship of global ordained leaders? Great question. That's a great question. Thank you for that question. At LSPS here in Austin, we, we started, you know, we offer uh, a team program of 16 courses. And so we developed and we have had our first two Latina pastors from our synod uh, were ordained, uh, came through our team program, and were ordained in, 19, in 2004 and 2005. One of them was my sister, Sylvia, who served in her, uh, the parish, my home parish, for about uh, 15 years before she retired. Uh, and so she and Alma then... Uh, Alma Morales, the first uh, Latina graduate, and then uh, Mariana Mendez, who uh, serves in El Ceniso in Laredo, Texas, came through our, our team program, uh, became ordained, and we take our students to Mariana at El Ceniso near Laredo every single year because she has such a powerful ministry along the U.S.-Mexico border. So long story short, we took 16 of the team courses. We took eight of the 16 and turn that into a certificate of Hispanic ministry. And so we offer that to laity. And Consuelo Reed, my administrator, uh, who serves, who makes me look good in everything she does, she took all of those eight courses and is a, 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 a committed lay person in her church uh, here in Pflugerville at Palm Valley, which has a, a Latino ministry there. And her pastor has been after her to become uh, ordained We'll see how the spirit unfolds in her life. But those are the ways that we have been trying to address that, that shortage and that need and that service. Uh, I, uh, another quick anecdote, I preached in uh, St. Peter's Lutheran Church in New York, Manhattan, uh, a couple of years ago, or three years ago or so, uh, as part of a Senate assembly. And, uh, and I, 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 address the Spanish-speaking Spanish community, which was at least 
250 in the, in the community in, the, in worship that day. And I addressed that specific need uh, and, and, and opportunity for service. And I, I told the community that every single woman, woman in that worship service needed to consider pastoral ministry, ordained pastoral ministry, and to pray about it, to seek discernment for it, that there were Spanish uh, course offerings that would uh, facilitate it for them. So I, I advocate for that whenever I'm invited to, to preach. But programmatically, uh, we, ha we have this Spanish uh, curriculum of eight courses for equipping of laity. And now, of course, we're moving to, we've moved everything to online. So it's, e it's e easier to get to us. You don't have to travel the way most of our team students had to travel from across the country because now we're offering our coursework online and in Spanish. Which is the be which is a a better way to 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 address that need? Thank you. A question from Andrea. I love the idea of hospitality as a human right. What are some ideas that you have for introducing this kind of concept to a faithful and quote set in its ways congregation? Oh, thank you. Thank you for that question. Well, uh, I think if you do a biblical study, you know, Dr. Hall has, has done excellent uh, PowerPoints uh, tracing all of this, the whole concept of hospitality. But if you, if you look at the whole notion of the, of the uh, in particular, the, the um, Hebrew canon and see how and do a PowerPoint, which is what I love to do, because I, I believe in the visual. Uh, it has more impact rather than just hearing words sometimes. Uh, and I've done one where, where I, I trace, the, I've done one on migration using all of the biblical characters in the, in the Hebrew canon and showing how it has been a, an entire history of migration through the present day, through the founding of the, of, the, of, the, of the state of Israel and continuing, you know, and this is just part of the, what anthropologists and sociologists have taught us for years. This is part of the of the human story, you know, uh, from the from the dawn of civilization, people have been migrating. But for us to keep it within the framework of faith, if you look at the Hebrew canon and trace all of that migration from from uh, from Adam and Eve as the first migrants, which I like to call, to Air to Sarah and Abraham, and uh, Abraham receiving the uh, the holy visitors, the holy visitation. Uh, that kind of a study will help, I think, teach your community, and it'll help them see the the the, the whole story of uh, migration that has a, a component of human right, the human right to life, which we all acknowledge is is the truth that we live by. Thank you, Dr. Alanis. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tag on what you said, and then I'm going to um, ask the next question um, because of some sound issues. So to tag a little bit on some of the question that, that Andrea asked, thank you so much for that question. Um, I think so much of what we're trying to model, as Dr. Alanis is, is pointing to, is the importance of storytelling, um, the importance of connecting the stories in the biblical text to the stories of our own experience. And that storytelling becomes a way of not only rooting in people's own experience, but then connecting back to the biblical text and to show the ways in which the work that we're doing is not, because these are issues that can become so easily politicized and these are issues that can become so divisive so quickly, especially because of the ways in which they're framed in the media um, especially because of the xenophobia that we've seen, especially um, over the past couple of years, that these are ways in which we can connect back to what in, often in faith communities is much more familiar ground um, in terms of the biblical text. But to do that in a way that both meets people where they're at in their willingness to do Bible study, but is then intentionally reframing these texts. Um, and so just pointing to what... You, is happening when you say, yes, Abraham and Sarah were migrants, right? That, I mean, that you're saying, yes, 
we have the Abraham and Sarah story, but let's, let's rethink it. Let's reframe it. Let's find ways of connecting and ways of integrating our stories, the stories of our faith communities with the biblical story, but reshaping those, sh- those stories as, as we do that work together so that we're both meeting people where they're at, but then we're also able to maybe nudge them maybe a step further, you know, recognizing that this is, this is work that's built in relationship. This is work that doesn't happen overnight, um, especially on issues that can be um, so intense as immigration. And because pe- people are often just going to have that knee jerk reaction of I'm set in my ways. I've got my ideas about this. I know where I stand on this, but then the, the neutral ground, I don't even want to call it that, but the, 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 the common grounding of the text can then can create some space perhaps. Um, so I think it's a really important strategy for trying to engage. You can say the most radical things when you quote the Bible. I mean, it's just, it's kind of amazing. Like I didn't say it, the text said it, welcome the stranger. <laughs> um, so, and now I'm gonna transition to um, the question that Emily was asking. And Emily is also joining us from Texas. I believe one of our students um, so Emily says, um, how can we meet people pastorally outside of the church context? Uh, my work at Casa Marianella in Austin allows me to interact with immigrants from around the world in a non-religious context. What is a culturally sensitive way to make sure that their faith needs are met? Mm. Wow, that's a great question, Emily. In fact, I think I know Emily. So thank you for your question, and thank you, Dr. Hall, for contributing to uh, to the hermeneutical circle. We went completely around, and that's beautiful. So thank you for sharing your thoughts. Uh, I think that, um, you know, if you know where people come from, I, I happen to be a very curious person, and I am very well-traveled, so I like to learn about people even before I get there, if you will. So I also like to learn the faith traditions and cultural practices of my neighbors. And so that's a study that, that's a, um, a task that I impose, if you will, upon myself. That's, in fact, a duty that I feel like I'm, I'm compelled to do on behalf of the gospel, on behalf of human rights, on behalf of advocacy for my neighbor, on behalf of justice for my neighbors. So, of course, you can only learn so much from books, and, and that's very important. Uh, I have the experience, for example, of having um, had a Hawaiian student uh, at the Episcopal seminar- Seminary that I taught, and I became a spiritual director. And because of him, I learned all of this, inf- all of this history of Hawaii that I did not realize, that I, I hadn't learned. I certainly didn't learn it in, in American history. The history of the takeover of the islands, the history of aloha and what it means, the history of the hula and how it was banned by the early missionaries in their, in their cultural myopia and, and that was reintroduced as part of the civil rights work of the Hawaiians in the 1960s and 70s as part of the natural, cultural and spiritual tradition of native of the native peoples of Hawaii. So I I asked him what books should I read and he he told, gave me a list and I've read like five of them. Because I I met him, I learned his I learned the 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 painful memory of his history and as a result of my relationship with him. So I it was my duty I felt to learn about that history because it's an it's american history and and if he's my student he's my neighbor i'm compelled to learn something about my neighbor so i did my work and then i visited him during my sabbatical and he was able to show me and teach me the insights the spiritual insights of hawaiian culture that the tourist doesn't get so to answer your question i think you know we have a, a duty to learn ourselves about the culture and about the spirituality of other people. And then I think they themselves will sh- tell you or show you what is acceptable from you 
as far as meeting their spiritual needs. But I think the greatest way of doing it is just the entering into that relationship of care. It's, it's the deep listening and it's the meeting of the heart that will connect to people. So I hope that kind of answers your, your question, Emily. Thank you. Thank you for asking. Dr. Hall, do you have anything to add? And um, I'm happy to welcome um, President and CEO Krish Signaraja onto our Zoom time. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for having me. So we'll move on to our next question, and that is, are there any virtual groups or ways to partner with those on the border, Sharon asks. Uh, yes, I think, well, I, I recommend people uh, look, looking up Angry TS and Abuelas and Team Brownsville on Facebook. You probably can Google them and it'll show up. Angry TS and Abuelas, it's a, it's a group of women, powerful women who do this ministry. But Team Brownsville is in Brownsville and they, they're ecumenical and they do enormous amounts of ministry at the bridge, at the border. They, they've been crossing for the border for a long time now. I'm not sure where, where, the, where they're at with that because of COVID, but they have been doing it for quite a, quite a long time. Those are the two. Then, of course, there's Catholic Charities in McAllen that has received national prominence, and I've been to that center. Uh, and Sister Pamentiel, I believe is her last name, she, very prominent spokesperson for the Social Justice Ministry of the Roman Catholic Charities Organization in McAllen, which is at the heart of the Rio Grande Valley. Those are three prominent ministries that uh, you can Google and, and uh, connect with. If I can just jump in here, um, I'm gonna both selfishly, but also knowing the audience, uh, make a plug uh, for the amazing Lutheran networks that exist. Um, LIRS partners with two local affiliates, Lutheran Social Services in the Southwest, as well as Lutheran Family Services Rocky Mountains. We have what was a critical program along the border called our Welcome and Respite Work. When families, um, individuals crossed over the border, were processed through Customs and Border Patrol, and oftentimes dumped in the middle of the night at a bus depot, at a public park, Literally nothing but the clothes on their backs, we immediately mobilized. And so what we created was basically pop-up shelters at churches, an interfaith effort that involved obviously Lutherans, um, Episcopalians, uh, some of our Jewish um, network, uh, Catholics. And what was so amazing was we were able to provide room, board, medical screenings, showers, help in terms of the logistics of getting these individuals to extended family, friends that they have all across the country. Um, it's work that, you know, of course, the government didn't pay for because in the last few years, um, welcoming the stranger hasn't really been uh, the screed. But we all know um, that as a matter of faith, as a matter of American values, um, this is our calling. And so if anyone wants to learn more about the, the Lutheran Network, um, would please encourage you to get involved. Unfortunately, the southern border has been largely shut um, to even the most vulnerable children who are seeking refuge from human trafficking. Um, but we are continuing to champion both in Washington, D.C. at the state level, as well as on the southern border, um, that this change and that we be there uh, to walk and welcome the stranger. Thank you so much. Christopher writes, Psalm 46 declares, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. This is the hymn source of Luther's a mighty fortress. I marvel and I am challenged. If God is our refuge, we who sing and pray this are thereby refugees ourselves. This invites us to find essential kinship with refugees of all sorts and offers ways for us to build bridges. Um, let's see, next one. Um, John says, thank you for a wonderful presentation. Uh, I feel sometimes we can be disconnected from the immigration crisis. Dr. Hall mentioned your story. Do you feel there's a good way to remind our people of their immigration story? 
maybe have them write and tell them in a fellowship to reconnect with crisis. Is that addressed to Dr. Hall? I, whoever, it's tossed to the presenters. <laughs> Dr. Hall, would you do it? Absolutely. So I think it, um, not knowing the context in which the question asker is working, uh, my first que one of the questions I always am asking of my students in their writing is, who is the we in this context? Because I think that really does matter. Um, because if it's the we of a white, wealthy suburban congregation, that's a very different we than um, a Latinx community working on the US-Mexico border. Um, so I think the, the first, I think there's a, a question of interrogating the positionality of, of who is we, um, asking the question, where, where are we located socially, politically, economically, culturally as a faith community? And I think one of the ways in which we can start to begin to answer that question of how do we connect with our own stories is recognizing our positionality and what work might have to go into wrestling with some of that, asking the questions of like Dr. Alanis have been doing, what is the history of my family? Do I know the history of my family? Um, are there contested histories within my family? But, and beyond that, how does my family's history connect to my community's history? Um, I mean, there's lots of examples just, you know, even to take from some of the experience that I've had as a seminary professor, Latinx students who grew up in the United States in homes where they were not, they were speaking English, but not Spanish. Um, and so there are these, you know, these, these questions are complex because they're, they're, they're asking us to do the hard work of perhaps not only telling our stories, but learning our stories learning our family histories and learning how those histories are connected to the broader histories. Um, so for example, when, when Dr. Alanis and I were, were chatting and planning for this, he immediately asked when we were talking about our own family stories, oh, did your family come through Ellis Island? And I had to think about it for a second. I was like, oh yes, they did. But I had to, but I had to do that work of remembering because it, it wasn't something that it, it was immediately in my, in my family cultural memory. Um, and so the, how do we begin to answer those questions, I think really depends on who is the we. Um, if we're doing this in a faith-rooted context, connecting back to some of what we were talking about earlier too, part of the ways in which we can build connection and part of the ways in which we can rebuild memory is the ways in which our, again, connecting our stories to the biblical story and recognizing the ways in which we as communities are marginalized and oppressed or the ways in which we as communities have certain positions of privilege, how do those connect back to the text and recognizing where there, where there is marginality in the biblical text, where people are operating at the center of the story. Because for the vast majority of the Jesus movement, they're at the margins. Of, of their context in the first century in the Roman Empire. The Jesus movement is not at the center of the story in the first century. The Jesus movement, they're at the margins of the story. And so that provides entry points to start to think about, okay, you know, is my church at the center of the story? And if, if my church is more at the center of the current cultural story, how do we reconnect back to our roots? How do we recognize where is the marginality within our own context, recognizing that's where Jesus chooses to be? That like being working on the margins, being on the margins, it's not like a nice liberal idea, but it's a faith claim. It's recognizing this is where Jesus is. This is where Jesus chose to be incarnate. And therefore, this is where we need to be. And so there's, I think there's a lot of unpacking to do in that question, but it's all very rooted in context. Sharon, you wanted to pop in. You have to unmute yourself. There you there go. go. Okay, thanks, Shell. Um, I wanted to pick up on something that Dr. Alanis said about worship practices. And I perked up when you talked about lifting up prayers that um, 
lift up, lifting up the plight of refugees in the prayer of the church. And I want to mention that on the LIRS webpage, each week we post a prayer for migrants and refugees that um, is written uh, with the lessons for the day in mind. And it corresponds to the structure of the set of petitions offered by Sundays and Seasons. That is on our ministry resource library. And while you're there, please check out um, each month we offer sermons and sermon commentaries that are written by immigrant faith leaders. And those prayer petitions, the weekly prayer petitions are written by immigrant faith leaders. Also, um, on the landing page for LIRS today, you will find our fall campaign called Gather Afghanistan, which offers stories and uh, hymnody, prayers, litanies for congregations and for families to learn about those who have immigrated as refugees, as special immigration visa refugees from Afghanistan over the years. In October, we will introduce our Hope for the Holidays campaign, which um, is a, an effort to reach out to those who are being held in immigration detention. And so there are many opportunities offered on our website for congregations to get involved in a way that um, lifts this up in worship and provides opportunities for education and fellowship around these issues. Thank you, Sharon. Well, moving, moving on, um, Jack from is joining us from Detroit. And um, Jack says, I'm, uh, it, are there ways that we can sign up to have classes for our congregation? And most specifically, he's thinking about a series by Dr. Hall on hospitality and um, Dr. Al Alanis on biblical migration. And so I can say, Jack, I will be happy to work with both doctors <laughs> um, to add that to our lifelong learning video library. Uh, but if you have anything to offer to that um, in addition, please, by all means. What I, go ahead, Dr. Hall. Please. All right, uh, thank you, Sharon, and for asking. Uh, I, I offer annually, well, pre-COVID, uh, week-long intensives that cover a, a host of themes about migration and, and advocacy, and I bring in speakers from the community. We, it's scheduled to, to be offered again next May, late, late May and June. We'll see where we end up with COVID. But with that brings people from all over the country, uh, laity and, and clergy, interested people, uh, to gather here on our campus for about four and a half days and and uh, kind of receive a plate full, if you will, of, uh, of a variety of themes that address uh, your concerns. I uh, recently have been asked to do it uh, by congregations via online video. So I'm doing that as a, as a kind of a, a evening seminar, if you will. And uh, so a group of uh, interested lay folk will gather perhaps the church council or leaders from the council, especially if they're trying to address how to how to minister to a changing diverse community around the parish. And so I and so I, I'm doing that these days. So you're welcome to touch base with me on that on that on that question. Yeah, just to echo some of what Dr. Alanis is saying, there's no there's no replacement for actually being at the border. Um, and and doing work in the borderlands. Um, and so it, I'll amen everything about the Lutheran Seminary program in the Southwest um, and the importance of being connected to that program. Um, there's really, you can't replace the physical presence of, of being in learning and uh, being among God's people in the borderlands. Um, and I, I'm not gonna put Reverend Baglios on the spot here, but maybe I am, um, that, uh, there's also some really great work that LIRS is doing in terms of congregational outreach and training. 
Um, and uh, for example, we just did, um, Reverend Baglios and I just put together a video on um, some some themes around the biblical mandate to welcome the stranger. Um, and so I just recorded a little video lecture that is going to be used by LIRS as a resource. Um, and so there's lots of training opportunities um, and connecting opportunities that are available through LIRS, through ULS, through the Lutheran Seminary Program in the Southwest. And so there's there's many ways in which to connect and to continue this conversation. I'll, I'll pick up on what um, Crystal introduced. Hers will be the first um, offering in our online training with the biblical mandate. And we will be offering um, the lecture or the presentation that Pastor Ed Whetstone is giving next week for this convocation on the Lutheran legacy. We are also developing a living legacy of welcome, which will feature people who LIRS has resettled through eight decades and the congregations who resettled them. And there will also be segments on how to understand uh, the whole refugee system and another one on asylum seekers and how that system works uh, and immigration detention. Um, also one on advocacy, how to make our voices, amplify our voices to uh, legislators locally on the state level and um, at, at, in Washington, DC. Thank you. Uh, just a comment from Charmaine. Thank you for this presentation. Much of the information presented gives credence to information I have researched on the topic. Thanks for providing practical ways to engage others in our congregation. God bless each of you. And then um, Greg Nepp um, writes um, that he's compiled a film filmography of um, various aspects of immigration refugee process with a list of questions for each film. And he's happy to share those. So if you're interested in those folks that are par participating, you can go into the Q&A and I will leave Pastor Nepp's um, email up so that you can see that. And then our final question, I'm calling this as our final question because I see our time has gone past. Um, Sean writes, what suggestions do you have to raise awareness of the need to be intentional about welcoming the stranger, especially of different cultures, in communities that are largely homogenous and often insular? Mm, thank you for that question. I think that uh, I'm going to go back to relationship building. What, uh, what the pastor at First English does here is, I mean, we all connect with the Home for Displaced Migrants here in town because it's, it's a center that all of us gravitate to. But we've entered into relationships or he has entered into relationships with some of the uh, folks there and then invited them to the congregation to tell their story. So that's a beginning, a way to begin, you know, the exposure, the, the, uh, the hearing of the story, which I believe always helps to raise consciousness, if you will. I, I borrow from uh, Paulo Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed. You know, you raise consciousness when, you, when you're when you exposed to the story of someone living an existential angst, such as many asylum seekers and refugees and displaced peoples do. So, you know, entering into a relationship with someone in your community and then inviting them into your safe space. And I always, I advise my students that when they're going to do that, to prepare the community before they invite the guest to speak. In other words, we want to be careful not to commit cultural violence. And that's something I teach about at LSPS, it is, is the disrespect of a person's journey, because it may not agree with our you know, politicized uh, experience. It's not about the politics. It's about the humanness and the human, humane treatment of, 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 of a neighbor who is with us. And so I kind of prep my community that we want to be, re, we, I, I always recommend respectful guidelines um, that I think Eric Law has taught the whole church ecumenically about in his book, 
The Wolf Shall Dwell with the Lamb. I highly recommend that you read that. It's a, a primer for all of our students. It's a, a book that teaches about cross-cultural communication and, and respectful ways of doing that. Uh, so, you know, uh, it takes a little work, a little prep work to do it well. But we always want to be involved in a conversation that is going to honor the guest, respect their human dignity, affirm their human dignity, and invite the community to deep listening, to listening more than asking questions, if you will. Because sometimes questions that are not thought through can commit violence, and I've seen that in my experience. So we want to prevent that. So there's some homework to do about that. Don't do it cold. You know, do your homework and connect with others who have relationships with with folks in the in this community in these communities so that you can start learning, you know, how to how to be in relationship with this these persons or community and then how to gently ask questions as you as you uh, learn from each other. Uh, and so that's a methodology that I, I hope will help. I can just add to that. Um, related to finding representatives in your community. One of the things that LIRS has um, historically supported is a Refugee and Migrant Leadership Academy. And part of the theory behind that is that immigrants can be the best spokespeople uh, for um, this work of welcoming the stranger, um, of explaining why they were fleeing and what um, the country has meant to them in terms of not just saving their life, but also allowing for them to be valuable contributors into the, in their societies and in their local communities. But frankly, either the second best or the equally powerful ambassadors are each and every one of you. And so um, LIRS, part of why we have always sought to find um, local representatives, um, community members who want to partner with us is because you can be our ambassadors in terms of, uh, you know, um, frankly, fighting uh, fiction with fact. So much of the fear mongering we've seen in the last few years is because this issue has become politicized and divisive for no good reason. And so just to give you a couple examples of, of the work that you can do in your communities, um, you know, whether it's through social media or you know, writing in local papers, um, letters to the editor, is that you can clarify um, some of the, the myths out there. Um, when people talk about immigrants as criminals, we know that there are, you know, there's research, there's data that shows when you look even at the top 10 cities that have absorbed refugees, nine out of 10 of them have become substantially safer. Um, the one exception was Springfield, Massachusetts, which you know was dealing with an opioid epidemic. When we think about um, immigrants right now, there's a lot of rhetoric as immigrants, as um, uh, people who are gonna steal jobs from Americans. When, when you look at the data, uh, immigrants are actually job creators. When you look at the data of um, you know this myth of people saying, well, immigrants are coming here and they're taking public taxpayer dollars. Um, and you look at the actual data and you see that, well, you know, it's actually a net benefit of when you look at refugees, $63 billion um, dollars of, of how they've contributed to our economy. Um, you know, those are kind of the, the functional um, arguments and data that you can use to counter. But, uh, you know, it's that combination of, of saying that we are called by our faith to do it, along with the fact that it actually contributes to our society as opposed to taking it away that I believe are the most two, two of the most powerful arguments we can put forward. And, and if you can be our ambassadors on the ground, um, I, I do think that we will change the, the arc of the conversations that we're having right now. Um, so, you know, obviously, uh, Sharon has mentioned a couple of ways in which we're providing those resources um, through our website. But, you know, whether it's social media, um, whether it is uh, kind of your local media, there are absolutely ways in which we can arm you and we would welcome um, your willingness to help us uh, spread the word. Um, um, one last question. Um, they asked, can you please repeat the book title that you mentioned? Uh, the wolf shall um, lie with the lamb, something like that, or the wolf shall dwell with the lamb, by uh, Eric Law. He's an Episcopal priest. Our time has come to an end. I want to thank all of you so very much for being with us today. 
Um, for our presenters and our partners, I'm deeply thankful for your engagement, your passion, and your work in this area, and for taking the time to edify us so that we can be those boots on the ground and um, we can be the advocates and the workers in the world. Everyone, I look forward to hoping to see you next week right back here at the same place where we'll continue these conversations. Um, certainly an hour and a half is never enough. And I feel like even 24 hours in a day for multiple, multiple days still would never be enough. We're scratching the surface, but we're going to continue on. Blessings to everybody. And I look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you so much. Thanks, Shell. Thank you, Shell. Thank you.